Hello everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How are we doing today? It's good to have you on this session. Hope you're doing great. Have having a very powerful um quiet but cold evening uh for those of us who the rain has hit in different parts of the country and beyond. Um it's really really good to really meet up with everyone here. Good evening. Good evening. Um so you're welcome once again to another session of the Startup Compliance Series. As always, I am your host, Rosemond Philopihua, and it's quite the honor and the privilege to actually be here again. Um, we are in our 10th series, so I'm pretty excited um, about how far this um, has gone. Uh, the Startup Compliance Series basically is an informative and educative um, series of webinars where we basically talk about core and critical legal compliance um, concerns, topics, um, issues for startup founders, um, startup uh, businesses, startup uh, businesses, and you know everything that really concerns to your growth and your productivity as a startup founder and as a business owner. A lot of people are very, very confused uh, in terms of the regulatory framework of what or how businesses operate. So uh, basically this series, you know, just talks about this in detail. Uh, we've talked about startup trends. We've talked about, um, last week, we had a very, very interesting session where we spoke to um, anti-money laundering and counter finance uh, terrorism, um, you know, regulations for startups. Talked about, you know, those of you that have not heard of what they call a criminal certificate, we did that. We talked about cyber security. Uh, we've talked about data protection. We've talked about taxes. Uh, we've talked about corporate governance and compliance. And we've talked about expansion to other territorial uh, jurisdictions as a startup and as a business. So uh, you can catch all the replays on our YouTube channel. And of course, we have these sessions live on LinkedIn as well. So you can always check our pages. So I just want to say a very big thank you uh, if you've been here following us, joining. And if you will be watching this after this live session, I'm very excited to welcome you. Thank you very much. It's always such a pleasure to really just um, share knowledge and who has participated in this session, sent us questions. Um, we're always very excited to help and to, you know, just do our part as far as this is concerned. So without further ado, uh, we have our guest, but today we're gonna to be talking about um, intellectual property protection for startup founders and startups, right? Um, IP is such a very, very vast field. And for those of us that understand how important it is right now is that, you know, um, having an idea is great, but being able to protect that idea being able to use that idea to get the maximum benefit, being able to understand your rights as a founder when it comes to the ideas you have is super important when you are building um, a startup and you're building a company. So I'm very excited about our guest. Uh, she's not a strange face. She, I literally call her the queen of intellectual property. She's uh, really, really done a lot of amazing and interesting work in this space. She goes by the name of Rita Anwari Chinda, who she's currently in the background. So uh, please, may, let's make welcome. Hi, Reginald, it's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining. I can see you live in the comment section. So uh, please make welcome my amazing guest, Rita Anwari Chinda. It's so exciting. It's so good to see you live on video. Uh, we're so used to, you know, seeing your posts on LinkedIn, seeing you speaking at engagement. Um, but I'm just really excited. I was able to have you all to myself today. So I'm very, very excited about that. Thank you for really being here with us. So um, definitely, we definitely have to introduce you. So pardon me, I'm going to be um, sharing my screen very shortly. Just want to introduce what you do and who you are to our guests who are going to be seeing this. So um, let, let me just share my screen now. You can see that. So um, Rita Amuri Chinda is a lecturer at the River State University, an intellectual property consultant for IG Nigeria Limited, who is a heritage consultant for the Lagos State Government, where she provides legal advice on how to commercialize and monetize the culture tourism and heritage of Lagos State by exploring intangible assets the state has. She holds a master's degree in intellectual property and information technology from the University of Derby, 
United Kingdom, the podcast host of the IP series, very popular one, I'm sure you must have heard of it, which features conversations on recent intellectual property cases and developments globally and has 93 episodes published with 17 blog editions on Substack. She's a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, CIR, um, Young Members Group, Global Steering Committee. And some of the things she has won is the 40 Under 40 Rising Star Award by the ESQ Nigerian Legal Award. She's the Chief Convener of the Intellectual Property Society of Nigeria, IPSN. Uh, she's the current peer of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, Podako Chapter Pro Tem Secretary, Young Members Group of Chartered Institute of Arbitrators for Accord Chapter. She's been listed on the inaugural, inaugural edition of the ESQ Legal Practice Magazine as one of the leading Nigerian women in business law. She's also been featured in the inaugural edition of the All Things IP Africa Magazine 2021 Young Lawyer, Young Legal Professional Recipient Award of Excellence 2020 WIPR Influential Women in IP Trailblazer. Please let's make welcome. If wherever you are, put a comment in the comment box. Just say a very big uh, welcome to Rita. Thank you so much, Rita, for being here. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you so much for doing this with us. It's a pleasure to have you. How are you doing this evening? I am well. Hi, Rosemont. Hi, sis. It's good to see you. Hi. <laughs> so good to see and you. Wow. I, I can I can literally feel the energy. It's so good. So good. So good. I love it. Um <laughs> yeah, so we, 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 we <laughs> let me. Right? So you said so I'm just gonna correct something. I know the last time when I sent you my my profile, I had 97 episodes, but now I have 102 episodes. And the hundred and third episode will be live on Monday. So, yeah. Awesome. Lovely. I love it. I love it. It's a, con it's a consistency for me. I love it so much. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, the thing is, um, the reason why I'm particularly excited about this session, guys, is because um, we are such, we are, we are in a very interesting time. Um, if you look at the the startup ecosystem we've really done very massive transitions from just being get getting excited about building a business we've come to understand that there's more that really makes a startup founder work or a startup business work and you know you cannot take away intellectual property from it so uh we have uh, we are eight minutes past you know seven and we are definitely kicking to get this down to an hour um i am very curious i would love to just hear from you what's been your experience um not only have you literally as far as i'm concerned become a major leading voice in the intellectual property space but i really want to understand what your passion is and why you think intellectual property is so important especially when it comes to doing business um not just as um someone as, as a business person right why is that so important to you because it is very clear beyond doubt that this is this is something that really means a lot to you as a practitioner so it's intellectual property and it really means a lot to you so i'm really i would really love to understand your thought process your passion behind you know what you do uh in the intellectual property space so if you could share that with us uh <laughs> your question is actually loaded <laughs> um let's see passion should i say manifest no i would say manifest but i would say is the <laughs> is the possibility that ip brings for startups and also the economy the society generally everything around us and as you know uh, and for many that do not know intellectual property ip for short is has its tentacles in every industry so be it um the expressions that you've put out there in form of musical works sound recording um sculptures architectural models um, choreography or the physical or the visual appearance of a product that you have or maybe your your startup is solving a problem in the society that we're currently experiencing, or it could be the name of your brand, the logo, the sign symbol, all that confidence gives your brand an edge in the community. So you find out that all of this has commercial value, and not every startup understands um, IP when it comes to that aspect. They are more focused on funding, getting investors, 
you know, getting their team. But they forget that pre-market stage is where IP plays a huge role in. In the pre-market stage, you are, that's where you have your concept, you do your market survey, you, you know, you engage your team. You should even be con considering documentation, but many of them actually do not put that into consideration. So, um, I, I mean, it's rare to find a client that understands that, okay, my business has IP elements and I need you to help me take it from ground zero to 100 or from ground zero to 50. Let's start from somewhere. I mean, when you have such clients, it makes your work easier. So when you're explaining, oh, when you do X, Y, Z, this is where it's going to push you. Or if I give you this strategy, this is how it's going to take you from point A to the next. I mean, it solves a lot of issues. But then when you, you, you kind of encounter clients that, um, so you're more focused on making pitches. Oh, I have these business ideas. IP does not protect an idea. And that's what most startups don't understand. Your idea is not protected unless we can see something. What is that product you have? What What is that um, um, concept you have that is in a fixed or tangible format? It's an intangible, is an intangible asset. But then how can we see? So you have created or built something and put it out there in public. You can't get a patent at the end of the day because one of the requirements of patent is that it must be new and you cannot disclose to the general public. It must also not be obvious to a skilled person within that particular territory. Then let's talk about visual appearance where you're, you know, taking combination of lines and colors or the aesthetics of a, a product or is it your, I mean, architectural work or the list of your distributor or the list of your manufacturer or where you get your fabric from, or where you get product from to build, whatever it is. We don't take any of that because, or is it the source code? Where do you get your source source codes from, or your object codes from, or basically your your software? Where do you get the elements of all those things? And you know, when 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 you encounter that, you find out that oh, most people don't even know. Oh, I hired this person. Basically, whoever creates the work, the first person that creates the work, be it a copyright or a patent or industrial design, is the statutory creator. Is the real or the first person that owns the work. So you hired someone to work for you, but then there's no contract setting that whatever that person states, he transfers it to you. You just give him a, a generic employment agreement that you, you Googled and, you know, gave the person to sign and then the clause there is like, oh, there's no, there's no assigning of any rights, whether economic, I don't say moral right because moral rights is a bit technical because you really can't assign it. But then if you do assign it in the contract, how can the law save you? And that is when you've given out all of your rights. And for all of this intellectual property, they all have um, exclusive rights. So for, for patients, you have the monopoly to control how to import, to sell that product. Same thing with design right or industrial design. For trademarkers, where you have the exclusive right to use that mark registered in the particular class under the nice classification, for copyright, you have a bundle of exclusive right to do as much as you are. Trade secret is one that gives you some sort of, I don't know, it gives you a lot of coverage, but you have to take um, extra measure to, pre to make sure that that confidential information in question is not, it doesn't get into the wrong hands, basically. So, for instance, now, um, you are trying to draw up a proposal to go and make a pitch and you haven't protected any of your concepts. So I know someone had, you know, discussed something with me in personal. I wouldn't want to share more details, but basically you made a pitch and you did not protect your intellectual property. I wouldn't say idea now because there's actually, it is in a tangible format. And the person you made a pitch to went ahead to use what you made a pitch to monetize it and commercialize it, and then you're crying foul. So what I usually tell people is, one, you can't go and tell your potential investor to sign an NDA because everyone tell you sign an NDA. It's easy to say sign an NDA than for you to actually give the person the document. So basically, I'll tell you, have a strategy from when you want to go into the market, after you've gone into the market and you start looking for funders. Because sometimes when you're looking for funding, your IP portfolio can give you an edge when you're asking for X, Y, Z. So if you watch Dragons Den a lot, and I would like people to really pay attention to that show. I mean, we started our own Nigerian version, but I think the few episodes I've watched, I've never heard any of the, the investors um, ask or the lions ask questions like, okay, you have a registered trademark or a patent for this. What is the worth of it if I give you X, Y, Z? But you find out that when you're watching um, 
dragons they ask you those questions so there was a particular episode when someone was like oh i have this business but this person um i sent an agreement with the person and he he is like like it was a bit complicated they asked just asked her do you have an ip registration for this and she said no does the person have an ip registration and she said yes so he was like hey, you basically know what you're coming here to make a pitch for so what i would tell you is save the funds as much as you're saving funds to pay your software developer or your employee or whatever save money and register your ip don't say it's too expensive because it's going to be more expensive in future when someone has taken the step to actually register and monetize because we apply what is called so for trademarks we apply what or for Peter, we apply what is called the first to file principle so if i file first i'm recognized as the ip author however and this is where it's for say trademark and someone knows that you are the actual owner. You can also oppose that registration um, for being registered in bad faith. That person did not do it with the intention of actually, but to, just to spite you. Then you have IP trolls, people who just register IPs and wait for you to come and claim it. And then kind of like a, a cyber squatting scenario, but in IP or for IP. So I would say my experience has been interesting. Uh, and I would say again, the pandemic helped a lot of startups to start be thinking um how ip plays a huge role um in their business or in in the industry that they are based in because prior to covid when you're telling someone that oh before you do this you know do your ip make sure you have data um, um data protection compliance xyz and the person is like he's like you're, you're not saying what he wants to hear because to him it's not it's not in my priority but your product is an IP product, basically. That thing you think your business is going to solve has elements of IP that if you have a good strategy, you can monetize in terms of licensing. So there's this guy, I don't know if you, there's this guy on, on, on Instagram that asks, asks people questions about um, um, the cars, the driver and all that. And then he met this particular doctor who was like, oh, Years ago, I created this product that wasn't functioning, but then um, a, 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 um, an, a, a hospital saw that it had commercial value and they licensed it for years. Licensing, licensing it to them for over 30 years. Someone is making money off a product that he thought that did not have, um, did not have a future. But some other person saw elements of that product and decided to, you know, go into a licensing agreement with the person, and he's making cool cash so when it comes to commercialization it's like an extra revenue for startups um cases like um the vox case against facebook and, and instagram how we or how we interact now on instagram live or facebook live it was someone's creation they tried try facebook tried to get you go into a partnership with them and it didn't end up working out and facebook took all the information that was shared in the course of the you know negotiation process back and forth. But luckily for this guy who happened to be in the Navy, he was quick enough to register or to patent it in the US. So he sued, I think it's one of the biggest um, damage given in the, I think it's almost like 700 and something million dollars. You know, but we also have um, a South African case of an employee now who um i think i've talked about it on my podcast also on my content who uh, because of love he was inspired so love inspired him to solve this issue so i, I don't know how many of you use please call me back he is the actual originator of please call me back so he did that because every time he was talking to his then girlfriend who is now his wife she always ran out of credit or they, he ran out of credit and there was no way to tell the other person oh i'm out of credit please call me back so he just thought about that and created it outside the confine of work so in as an employee you now have to look at your your contract does this say that any work you create outside the confine of the work or with in the course of employment so it's a bit complicated and technical and then you now have issues of non-complete clause where um, a former employee goes into the same line of business with his former ogre and you know they are both thriving but one person cannot come and say this person stole my idea so i i i someone um Shukrat mentioned this case, which I never knew about the bobo juice and video milk case. It's a clear example of an, an IP case. But one thing is, video milk is for adults. Bobo juice is for children. Hi, Rosemary, can you hear me? 
Can you hear me? Okay, great. So, um, another actually, I was, I was talking about the bubble juice case. So, basically, this person found that he's he, in order for him to compete or make more money, he has to, you know, find find a niche. So, as a startup, you also need to carve your niche. That way, you're able to excel and thrive. There's also another case of a paint company where a former employer left his ogre because of whatever reason and then went into the same line of business so if you don't have a non-compete clause i know that in california right now they are fighting the non-compete clause whereby um they are saying um non-compete clauses kind of restricts creativity and innovation it does not it does not it goes against the principle of intellectual property which promotes creativity and innovation so different jurisdiction has their, their concept but then for nigeria let's focus on nigeria where we apply the first to five percent. I know a lot of people feel that we, we our laws are not enforceable. Our laws actually do work. Uh, you guys just don't rate um specialized lawyers or law firms that actually cater to the needs of startups, be it from maybe if it's just the compliance or the IP side or the cyber, whatever issue. You guys just don't rate us, but I think you guys have been trying so far. <laughs> That's all just up there for now. I don't I don't even know I don't even know what to say, but you have literally answered I don't know, did you spy my notes? Because you've literally answered like five of my questions in one breath. Like I don't get it. But really, you know, it's so interesting that this is such an important field. So I'll give a different example, right? Because you've said very interesting things that basically every startup founder really needs to know because you can literally make money off your products You're, you've mentioned you've given examples several examples right even if you think the idea doesn't have its weight in gold you need to protect it because it's something that absolutely seems ridiculous now can really give you such intense and immense value in future you never know and it's something that you know founders and businesses should not wipe under the bridge you give it the example of the medical practitioner who invented the call me back um i don't know what's the name of the movie i don't know if anyone on the call has watched it right um this windshield it's called the intermittent windshield wiper someone invented it and he literally went to the car manufacturing company right to yeah. present the idea initially I, I, before I talk then, about that exactly like even before then a lot of people did like i think the wiper i talked about just, that to one of us yes he made the piece, he made the piece to yes so he was actually inspired i think he, he because he got into an accident during the raining season so he thought about him what can you do when it's raining that can actually help your you know driving whatever so he came up with that went to make a pitch to ford and you know he, he was there was prospects like okay person if that's say go invest in me then they called him after i was like oh you know that pitch you made can you give us a detailed explanation so when someone's asking you to give them a detailed explanation about your product this that's a big red flag don't do it save yourself the stress don't even bother um yeah. you might want to protect yourself and say okay let me send an email to that effect but anybody that after you made the first pitch best doesn't want to you know come back to you it just keeps tossing you back and forth you said this can you just the person is trying to take advantage of that don't give them that opportunity to get into yeah. your head basically you make your pitch in a very interesting way that you know that without this guy if we know you that oh my god pure so okay exactly i agree and you know at the end of the day like when they took his idea you just realized that they are taking his idea he went to court and it took such a long time like it was so emotionally exhausting for him but i think is it after 21 years i don't know how long i get but it was a very long time he finally won the case right that it was his invention so this is a lesson and with all these stories that have been shared it's just so clear to 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 anyone watching this that it is your responsibility to protect your idea there's something very interesting i want to add to before i move to the next set of questions right which is the fact that when you contract so a lot of startup founders and business owners when they are building right especially for the non-technical startup founders you are going to outsource a lot you outsource the building or the development of your web app um, you're going to outsource the development of your, maybe of your software, whatever it is, you're going to outsource and you're going to outsource to maybe an, a firm or an individual, right? You need to look at the contracts that um, define that relationship, 
right? And it's so important because the question is, you said something so important and it's something that I always look out for in every contract that I'm privileged to review on behalf of startup, which is who owns the intellectual property of this thing we are building? Is it categorically stated that it belongs to the founder even though the software developer is not the founder, is it is it is it black and white? Is there going to be a sub licensing arrangement? Is there going to be a software licensing arrangement or agreement that is now going to clearly state that whatever it is you are building belongs to the company? This is something. These are one of several things you've mentioned. Non compete. You've mentioned NDAs. You've mentioned non circumvention. Because the truth is that, for example, you are building a startup, building, building, building. You have your codes in your cloud and all that. Who has the keys and the access and the authority or the authorized access to those codes? You mentioned it at the beginning of this session when you're talking about your patents and all those software licenses. How do you protect those codes? How do you protect it? If it falls under the area of a trademark, right, your logos and all that. So it's just so important. It's so clear that you cannot build or be a startup founder and not pay attention to this critical aspect of your business because that's your wealth, your creativity, your idea, right? In fact, the whole essence of a startup is that you have seen a problem in the market you've defined a solution for it you've created a solution you want to scale that solution right so by the very nature of what a startup is it is innovative in it was the word originality so it has to be protected there is no there is no back and forth about that right so um i'm going to ask you one question which i know you are going to take us on another beautiful journey again right so um let's let it's it, it's very very it's very very fundamental but i think it's very important and i would love to ask ask this question right there are two questions number one what what is the key difference right between a patent a trademark copyright and trade secrets right because i know you get those questions a lot and as a follow-up to that what are the first steps right that these founders should start taking to protect, evaluate, and maybe identify their intellectual property assets because some founders don't even know the importance of what they have, right? So those are my two questions. So let me say it again, right? The first is, what's the key difference between a patent, a trademark, a copyright, and a trade secret? And then what are the steps that these founders, upon discovering what they are, to protect, identify, and evaluate them? So that's my question. So the floor is yours. Okay. So, um... Uh, before I, I get into that, I mean, one of the, the questions I get the most is, hi, Henri, so I was referred to you and I have this idea and I'm like, IP doesn't protect ideas. What exactly is your product? So you want to be iffy with me. You want to be, what's the word now? You don't want to disclose so much because you, you feel that as a lawyer, I may, whatever. But then we know that our RPC which guides our practice already states that there's confidentiality uh, between a lawyer and his client. I've even had a client go all the way and tell me I have to sign an NDA before he discloses whatever it is he had. I didn't have an issue with it, but then it just showed me that it was going to be a very difficult relationship. And then it really was because it didn't go anywhere. So to answer your question, how do you know when you have a copyright or you have a trademark, when you have an industrial design, a patent or a trade secret. So for copyright, luckily, Buari gave us a gift, gave the, the creative sector, gave the um, gave the industry a gift. We now have a new Copyright Act 2022, and it's very detailed. If you haven't read it, please take your time. It's about 65 pages long. Take your time or engage a copyright lawyer or a copyright firm or an intellectual property lawyer to take you through each of the section because now it's not i did not know or we don't have a law for that is there so copyright will protect literary and artistic work musical work sound recording um architectural work um broadcast work now the basic requirement is that it must be in a tangible format it must be a it must be original and it does not matter the um, the quality of that copyrighted work. What copyright will not protect are ideas, data, etc. Now, each of these copyright work or eligible work have a bundle of exclusive rights that lets you to reproduce, to publish the, to the public, to communicate to the public, to distribute, 
to adapt to translate to any language so you can adapt a book into a stage play into a movie into a, a whatever um for trademark trademark protects um the so the name logo sign symbol that so section 9 and, and 10 we say section 9 we say capable of distinguishing why section 10 focuses on the distinctiveness so basically uniqueness of that mark is it is it um, a coinful name um is it a fanciful name so as long as it's not descriptive and it's not similar to another existing mark and it's not the name of a a chemical or it's not sub um against public morality then you're fine however if you're in doubt you can engage a trademark lawyer a law firm to do a letter to the trademark registrar to verify whether the name that you want to use for your startup is unique or distinctive enough or meets the requirement under section 9 and 10 but we barely do that because when you tell someone oh i need to do this you're already thinking of money 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 why are you so focused on money instead of focusing on what's actually going to give you more money so get um then you then have industrial design uh, which is also known as design patent in the u.s so when you see people interchanging interchanging it depends on the jewish but when you see a nigerian still say design patent i just find it um i, I can't really control myself i just have to tell you it's not design patent in nigeria it's actually industrial design so you must meet the requirement under section 13 we said it must be be new and not subject to public morality however um if you go further down the 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 the, the act it says that the true the statutory what he uses there is statutory creator or statutory auto whereas for copyright it states auto then for trademark it's uh what, what's the word now it's not applicant to proprietor then for patent patent protects or solves issues in the society as long as it's new and novel not obvious to a skilled person um and has an inventive step once it meets this basic requirement then you're good to go however in the event where you do a public disclosure stating oh my company is about to solve the light issue in nigeria or we are going to take energy from a to b then you now have an issue because it's no longer new it's in the public domain and that will not meet the requirements whereas for trade security trade security will basically solve um so anything that gives your business a competitive edge in the markets uh, for instance the coca-cola recipe that everyone has been fighting for or let's say um you you recently created a 3d product that does xyz or you created this you have a a distributor or supplier that gives you something that you use for your product that makes your products you know stand out from all the products out there or all the startups out there um could be you know anything basically and you find out that i don't want to make it like an african or a nigerian developed country whatever but you find out that startups abroad are very secretive when it comes to you know list of suppliers list of um um customers or manufacturers whatever it is as the case may be they take extra measures either by um having encrypted documents limiting people that have access to certain information in the company um you know signing ndas or including a, a non-disclosure clause in your employment agreement or in your independent contract agreement whatever it is now under the copyright act the new act now now states i think i should look for it and just share it um the new act now states that if you work for government or any organization they automatically own what you have created while you're working for them if someone commissions you the commissioner owns the work so then again you know the the, the act also, also goes for that to make provision for when someone another startup can use your work but not for commercial purpose um for research private use um criticism parody satire but when it goes beyond all of but all the losses are why they are doing all they need to acknowledge it oh so this was um 
done by Rosemont and I decided to, you know, do X, Y, Z. Now, when you bring it down to when people use open source codes, there's a disclaimer where you also need to acknowledge whoever codes you are using. They don't go tomorrow and be lying to people that, oh, it's my code that I used to build this, this website or this app. That I mean, no, please tell, tell us the truth. I mean, very, disclosure is very important. And I'd like to draw our attention again to the Startup Act, which was also, you know, another gift from Buari. So we should we should take Buari. I mean, in eight years, he has done a, a lot of things. Section 31 of the Startup Act talks about protection of intellectual property rights, where the council acknowledges the importance of IP. Um, it is going to ensure that IP owners' rights are exploited and commercialized. They will also lay us with the um, registries from the Copyright Commission to the Trademark Patent and Design Registry. They will make sure that they have a separate section for on the startup products for ease of registration. So you see that this act itself also knows the value of your intangible. But you, as the startup, you don't even know the value of what you have. You are just relaxed, like, okay, what do you do, you know? So what do you need to do? First of all, engage a lawyer. You may not like us, but we love you very much. We are here for you. Your business is our business. We are going to be besties for life, you know? So I always look, look, or uh, follow conversations in the international space because, so for IP practitioners, there are a lot of IP events that, you know, and when you look at the panel of speakers, you're seeing IP lawyer for, this person, IP from the IP department of Ericsson, uh, Microsoft, this one, that one, I'm like, how many, how many startups or companies in Nigeria actually have an IP department or a research and development facility or research and development department? We don't have any of that. So what you need to do first, um, pre-market stage, identify, after you discuss your lawyer, your IP lawyer, he will help you identify what elements of your products has commercial value. So you now have a, a, a strategy on how you're going to monetize either the way that you assign your rights to someone. So for instance, if you notice during the pandemic, there were conversation on the vaccine. That's an IP. And why people are, people are saying COVID is not real? So to each is old, though, we're not going to have that conversation here. But what I'm saying is that that conversation had to come up because they were considering that they should waiver the IP rights of the scientists that actually own the IPs to the molecules or chemicals or whatever it is that they use in creating the vaccines. How do they compensate them? You know, so on that um, patent, you have what is called the compulsory license where the government will step in in an event of a situation like that. So you're going to give us a license. It's not an exclusive or not an exclusive license. It's a compulsory license that you must give us because you're basically trying to help an issue or solve an issue. And like I said, patent basically is for products or services that solve and just solve something in the society, basically. So once you've identified that, oh, this, so this part of my project has um, a patent, whatever. You consider patent, put it, book it down. You don't have to release everything to the market so that everybody knows that ah, this startup is doing well. I mean, now we, we, there are a lot of viral seed fundings, yeah, but there's no viral IP uh, publication this startup created this and has a patent for this or has an id registration for this or have you heard any nigerian startup that you know, they are fighting over their trade secrets we know the era you know they like seriously or i think the most common one would be oh my name is similar to your name or my sound composition is similar to these but when it comes to the patent aspect it's very they are very minute um, I'll take us to the INEC case where someone has who had been a long time contractor. INEC, sorry, I'm not the court, but what the court decided was that INEC actually stole their patent and design rights. So they asked INEC to pay money to the person. But INEC, I don't know, till the, the judgments, um, the Siganishi order, and you know, Pesmenti Wala. Um, several other cases as well. I mean, the conversations are great, but we need more of those type of cases in Nigeria. So that startups to say, oh, so there's a precedent out there that this person did X, Y. I mean, we had the case of Norway's and side refer, you know, yeah, I, I don't want to talk too much about it, but you heard what I said. Um, <laughs> that conversation went viral. So then it, we had an instance of, that was during the pandemic, where someone had gone to make a pitch to First Bank for their 150th anniversary, and his logo was used 
at the end of the day and he came to twitter and was crying um different you know once you start having that your your ip lawyer um he'll tell you what to do which one can be copyrighted which one to take extra precaution in terms of sharing confidential information with third parties how can you make sure that your employee after they leave you because it's like i think it's like a stipulated minimum requirements at least five years that your employee former employee cannot go into the same line of business as you which is why the california jurisdiction is fighting it so much saying that it's restricting creativity and innovation so once you figure that part out do your registration monitor it most companies have um retained the services of lawyers or use companies or third party uh, organizations to monitor their ips within their jurisdiction and outside the jurisdiction. then if you also have plans of expanding into other jurisdiction you now have the regional registration under oap and aripo if you now want to expand internationally like i used to, like someone said i want to do international registration so i had someone that kept telling me i want to register in all the countries in the world i'm like guys it's not possible you can't even afford it tell me the jurisdiction that you want to expand to. So let's know if they are under the international um, registration or regional registrations that we can look out for. And then say, okay, we'll use the EU IPO or the UK IPO or the, the Australian IPO or the US, you know, PTO, whatever it is. Or let's go through OAP or RAP. But you're telling me, insisting, and it's as if they are fighting me. If they're like, money is not the problem, do the mass and tell us, Oga, if once you see the bill now, we hear that lawyer is expensive. No, because the cost includes the registration and my professional service, which is what most people don't even understand. So I've had an instance where I told someone, oh, you need to do a trademark. And he was like, oh, I need to do this another application and they need an acknowledgement letter. I'm like, okay, so this is what's going to cost you to do a trademark. Trademark will take you at least 18 to 24 months in Nigeria. And it's not even a Nigerian thing. For instance, the <clears throat> this is not startup related, but Pitbull, registered his grito yell of and it took him 18 bloody months in the u.s and then someone is telling me you can get your trademark registered in two weeks i told him bye bye it's not by force oh i found a okay he came at me i'm like oh i found a lawyer that didn't even charge me for consultation and he told me i'm going to get my certificate in two weeks i'm like good for you because i know you still have a position to face who's going to give you a trademark certification a trademark certificate in two weeks it's not possible so you have clients that sometimes are very impatient even when you're telling them okay you always need to put in the nigerian factor when you are doing all of these things um we had a meeting with the with the, the town hall meeting with the trauma it was very very i mean the conversation was nice um i i, I would say for for me when when you have when you attend startup events or tech events there's no conversation on ip or any creative event there's no conversation on ip everybody just focused on we are solving this we are solving that and i'm like ah uh -uh. you don't know that what you are solving has ip in it like seriously fam what are you people actually doing so your team can make or break you at the end of the day if you don't have a good team that understands the commercial value that you're putting so i have this very i mean i always like to anybody i'm, I'm, I'm always rating this my client i'm like it's one of my best clients ever it's very very detailed um for every conversation we're having, oh, he knows from the get-go that what he's doing has IPM. So he, my work is, um, uh, legal help us identify the IP elements of this work that we need to do and any other legal thing that we need to do. So because he has mentioned IP, my horns are ready, my antenna is standing, I'm like, ah, this one, making my job easier. Or like people that you tell, oh, this is what you need to do, okay? And the first thing you'd be like, um, at the moment, it's not in our priority. Okay, okay. So, no know like not your priority yeah i've been hilarious you'll start with so i had this conversation with at xyz and you'll not see one long thing and then we'll not see the 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 real the laws advising you should have patented that thing i didn't know this. i didn't know it's patent so most people don't even know the difference between the type of ip mechanisms that we actually have so it's first you need to have so you may not be a lawyer but that crash course on ip very important for you as a startup, whether you see it as being important or not, it's very important. Then for every session people are having, make sure you have a legal um, person that understands how IP affects the startup space. Uh, I think I've basically answered your question, <laughs> but if I have...
I'm not. You have. Why is it and it, like, like I said, that's why I just allowed you because you literally have answered. You just keep answering like five of my questions at the same time, and I love it because we are actually pressed for time. Um, we are forty. We are forty-five minutes into this session, and it's just a lot. If there's one key thing I have identified from what you said so far is this. You need to have a legal person that has intellectual property knowledge to, first of all, identify your business, identify the moving parts of your business, and identify the parts that are very critical and have the need for protection, right? And you can't really make a lot of traction without that. Um, I wanted to, sh I, in fact, when you, when you also spoke, you also spoke to the fact that, you know, there are different moving parts of your business. And Patent is different from trademark. Trademark is different from copyright. And I really love how you've explained, because of course, yes, we have a new copyright act. And that act literally, you know, has really done a lot of exposition on what it really, really requires for you to be able to, you know, leverage on your copyright act. So for those of you that are just watching and joining this, you need to get access to the copyright act. You need to look at it. You need to read it and understand what your rights are. I have, I have a follow-up question to this, and I hope you can just address it in like a minute, right, because of time. Um, yes, you said something about 18 to 24 months for registering a trademark. To be honest, I have, I, I have played in that space, and I know that what we think we call trademark registration, and I'm really being specific about trademark now, is not, is not trademark registration, right? You do a window search, you get an acknowledgement letter, you get an acceptance letter, Please, I need you to in one minute, and I'm very serious. You don't need, don't give us free advice. In even if it's thirty seconds, explain. Like, let's understand what this trademark process is about because I know there's a gazette stage. So a lot of founders are like, "Oh, we have the acknowledgement letter. We have registered our trademark." You have not. You have just been acknowledged. We have an acceptance letter from the registry. Oh, and a lot of us lawyers, and I would admit. We front that and say, yes, we have now put it. Yes, fine, you are in the pipeline. You've done it in part, but it's not complete. And you mentioned something about you've had a conversation with the regulators. Why is it taking so long to get our trademark certificates? What's the challenge? Because I know that there's supposed to be a gazette. What's the process? How long does it really take, right? And please, be comfortable with sharing with us information you are comfortable with because i know that people will still have to come and meet you and you will build them well because this is not <laughs> do you understand so just if you can answer that question for us and let us know what we are really doing because i see a lot of things being thrown out and it's saying in the name of you registered your trademark and we think we registered and we really not so please just in one minute please very specific one minute explain that process to us thank you Okay, so um, throwback. I mean, today is Saturday, but I have a throwback story to answer this question. So I know when the whole Sabinus case was trending last year, I did an extensive post. And in one of the posts, I stated, and I, did you know an acknowledgement and acceptance letter does not stand as trademark certificate? And I had a lawyer tell me, How are you? Why are you there? And I was like, But it's the fact now. Like, there's a whole process on, I mean, the process of registering a trademark. It's not the same as trademarking it. It's kind of like the Domitila case. She applied. She doesn't own. You're still in the process of registering that trademark. So basically, the, the, the format for a registration will be first, you do a search to verify if the name or device that you, or the mark you want to use is available in the class that you want to register. Because we have 45 classes. So can two names exist? Yes. However, if the test of likelihood of confusion comes into play. There is an issue with your registration already. And one of the good things that the registry does, I'm going to comment them for that, is they will tell you, oh, um, so in the search stage, you get your, your feedback, class D. So there's a similar name in class D called this. A similar name in class D called this. What that tells you is that, okay, your math may not really be original or, or Nico, I stated that under the provisions of the trademark regulation and the trademark act, if you are uncertain before you even commence your process of the search, you can do a letter to the trademark registrar asking them for an advice. So I want to do the registration in this class, and this is the blah blah blah. Does it meet the requirement under section nine and, and ten? You get your feedback, yes, no, and what you need to do. 
So if you decide to skip all of that and you come and meet me, because I know when I started practicing, uh, we had that issue where I don't want to badmouth anybody, but then you have agents that are very deceptive. They tell people that your acknowledgement is your certificate. How? Like you can get it in two weeks, you can get it in one month. Dude, trademark. The reason why it takes that long is because that principle or doctrine of distinctiveness is very important. Once your mark is distinctive, the benefits are numerous. You can claim exclusive ownership of that mark in that particular class. Emphasis on particular class. Before people will say, I we said you should was registered in one class, you only one. That's not what I said though. In that part, so if it's class one or class two or class 10 or class 35 or class whatever class it is that your, your business is. So my first point of question is always, what do you actually do? So that tells me it's able for it's easier for me to now streamline okay, which are the classes. So I've had consultation with a colleague that was representing someone. And initially you came to do one registration with no direction. But after our conversation, we found out that he needed like two to five. Two to five means more money. But because as a startup, you're trying to save costs, what I would not advise you to do is to pick the most important that you feel I must do it at this point in time. If I don't do it now, it's going to be an issue. So pick that one, start with that one. Then with time, you build from that. Then after your search, you then move, you then file. So once, once um, you've confirmed that the details are filed online, you then move to the acknowledgement stage where you are issued an acknowledgement copy after filing. Acknowledgement, we have received the application. Now wait for us to get back to you. Now the acceptance letter that most people get. Some people get rejected. I've gotten a rejection before. But we, we were told that we could appeal that rejection. And if we show cause that... Um, the mark in question what was actually distinct. So that particular case is one of the cases that I, I'm very sensitive about because the lawyer did not even understand where I was coming from. From the very moment we had our conversation, and you know, the thing is when you're dealing with your colleagues, they are very, they really don't want to pay for consultation, but you just believe, oh, you shall owe them something. They are entitled to, to you, whether like they or not. It's easier when you're dealing with the client directly. And I said, this this thing you want to raise is a mixture of a lot of common words that, the registry might say is too generic and you cannot own sentences. For instance, you can't use the, the, the Nigerian flag or the, the um whatever. There are certain things that you, you're not, you can't even use Red Cross in your trademark application, or whatever. So there are certain things that we need to go through. And then I advise, can you guys change it? I said, no, we want to use this. And I said, fine, we'll start the application. And we started, we had a bit of a hiccup. Um, I was told the catalog for that particular class was missing. And it took them about a month to find it. And I was telling this person, just chill. Because me, I already know myself. I don't even know for trademark. I just apply and I, I just relax. Like, I'm not going to stress. I just need my client to understand that this is something that takes time because the examiners need to do... I'm not the only person applying. She'll get. The examiners need to take their examination seriously in determining whether this mark in question is capable of distinguishing and is actually distinctive in nature in that class they want to register. So if it's not, you get a rejection with an advice. But if you pass it, then you now have to go to the next thing, which is like the yoga, pata, pata, the publication in the journal, opposition, three months, you must. I will know that because it's, um, let me not say it, but then you have to wait for your turn. When it gets to your turn, your mark will eventually. So you now have to be monitoring the registry at every interval. Either you have a connecting there, like, ah, guy, half I fear me check where I don't publish my own. If you're lucky, it comes. If you're not lucky, to you wait for the next one. And the registry publishes quarterly. So if the first one comes out, you all know day. Just be calm. Don't be making it look as if the person wants it. I know how much is the money that you even that I even charge that you feel that the money is going to get me a house in Banana Island or Metama to start with. It's not. Do you understand? But it, it, when you're building, you don't put all those stress into consideration. Okay, this is a long-term project. Do I charge you for that long-term project? Do I just charge you for just reducing that service once and for all and then move on to the next brief? So opposition is the stage where it's a compulsory stage where the mark can be opposed by a third party. This is where trademark opposition comes into place. Where someone can oppose and say, it was registered in bad faith, 
the person that registered it, um, the mark is similar to my own. Um, and, 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 and then that the timeline for that is two months from the date of publication, not three months, like I said, it's two months from the date of publication. So if you scale through and nobody goes to register to say, oh, this mark is similar to my own, you don't have an issue. But when someone opposes your registration, that is another pr uh, process where the lawyer now has to go and represent you and give show cause, file documents, processes. You're still going to pay for that service because I did not include it in my initial um um, charges when I was billing you to say, oh, what do you trade my registration? Because I never even expected that we were actually going to um, get to the point where I have to do... I mean, you have it at the back of your mind, but you just pray that once you scale from, from search to filing to acknowledgement to acceptance, you're halfway through. Do you understand? So you're not moving gradually. So if you now wait during that period... So the main thing is... Other than the examination, the opposition stage is the one that is that takes longer time because one, well, the registry has a lot of application on their on their on their hands. And I think a few weeks ago they said Pebec awarded the trademark registry for clearing all their backlog. I still have like a couple there. They said they've cleared all, but it's all right. It's all right with ten goods. Um. Then you now have the certification, which is issuance of certificates and publication is confirmed. So sometimes you find out that people might want to charge you for opposition stage because I might need, I might have to buy the journal. The journal is not, it's not cheap. It's not expensive, but it's not cheap at the same time. So if I'm buying all the publication, who is, who is going to foot that bill? Someone has to foot the bill, but your clients don't understand that. So you find that some agents would rather charge you, oh, for search, I'll go take this amount. For acknowledgement, our charges. So I had an instance where I reached out to to a, a classmate of mine and I advised her like, "Oh, I see you're thriving so much in this in your day. Why don't you consider trim?" And I gave her a word of view. And then she comes the next one to tell me, "Oh, someone told me he can do it cheaper." I said, "Fine." Then she comes and say, "Oh, I want to ask. The person is charging me for acknowledgement, for acceptance, for this." I'm like, "Dude, that is how the person wants to charge you. I don't. I say I'm not going to put my my hand and spoil. Pour, I'm not going to pour sand for person guy. You know, any anyone charge make it charge you, but." I shall give you a one of you, but you felt that one was a better one. So go with it. So if you're dealing with a law firm, a law firm will definitely give you a one of fee. That's a law firm. If you're dealing with me as an individual, or if you're dealing with my consulting firm, that's different. Do you understand? So everybody has their skill. You always get questions like, oh, what is your official rate? I can't tell you official rate because I do plus, plus, plus. Official rate plus my services equals to this. That is all I know. Sometimes you might want to add VAT, but you find out that clients push back when you add VAT. Do you understand? So why is it long? Because examination must verify that your marking question yeah. is mm -hmm. All right. Uh, wow, thank you. I'm, I, I'm sure you've gone through, like, I, from your voice, I can tell that a lot has gone through you and you've gone through a lot in this space. Uh, but as much as we know, that they can be very interesting clients. I know that they are they are from from these conversations that we are having. Like we, it's about awareness, really, and it's important to realize that. Um, I always say this. So whenever I'm privileged to speak at any event where I'm speaking to corporate governance or you know uh, compliance for tech startups and all that, one of the things I always say is, how do you genuinely view legal services? Do you view it as a vitamin or a painkiller? That's my that's my brand question because a lot of people see it as it's a nice to have, it's not a must have. But one of the things I always try to do beyond just being very aggressive in how I want to put my point across, I just tell them and I say, guys, like this is an investment, right? You will thank me, right? It may, and don't look at it as an expense. Think of it like you are making an investment. And I think that's what this is. And, you know, with the experiences that you've shared with us, it is very clear that you know, you need to have the guidance of somebody who has worked in this space with the amount of experience that you have. And, you know, it's very, very important to, you know, they use it in quotes, follow who no rules. So let's taper down to the concluding, but there are so many things to discuss, but definitely one hour doesn't cut it. So if you want additional, now I think this, the floor is open for questions um i see that we have very interesting viewers so i'm actually monitoring youtube and linkedin and i can see that the conversations are really quite interesting and i'm very happy that we have a, a um, an audience right now so i'm very excited about that um drop your questions um the floor is open for questions while i ask my final question right so 
um, we had a very interesting event recently, the Hilda Bassi cooking competition. And a lot of people have been doing thought leadership on it. And it's very interesting uh, to see, to see, you know, a lot of things come out of that. Um, but, and that's coming from my question, right? Because everybody, you know, there are so many ways you can make money off your property. I wanted to talk to a founder out there that wants to know how do they convert this idea to cash? How do they convert it to, how do they really, because there are so many experiences that, like I remember when I was going through your post on LinkedIn, where you talked about the intellectual property aspects of that event in itself, the brand deals, you talked about, you know, recipe, there's so many things, right? So maybe share with, and you use that as an analogy for any kind of startup founder who has something and, you know, they try to find how to convert that to, or they just want to know the value, right? Um, share that with us while we leave the floor open for questions. And when you're done sharing, then I'll ask for our concluding thoughts and we'll round this session up. Thank you. Okay, so I think Hilabas is like the, the most viral thing this month of May. And May is my birthday. And May is also, also made my podcast three years. So... The same way Hilda hits 100 hours, I've, I've hit 100 episodes from my podcast, so kudos to me. So I'm going to use myself as a, a point of contact right now. Um, so how do you monetize? I think as a, a startup or as a creative entrepreneur, um, you need to have a goal. What is your goal? When I started podcasting, it wasn't because I enjoyed podcasting or, um, you know, I just wanted to do so. I felt, oh, there's no podcast on IP. I thought there were there were not. But prior to me coming on board, I saw a couple of foreign podcasters that you know were talking about intellectual property. I followed the UK IPO podcast a lot and some other persons. But then I had people like you, like Fate, like Beverly, or like I really do a lot of tweeting mini blog. Why don't you convert it into podcasting? And I was like, oh. That's a lot of work. That's a lot. And I kept pushing and pushing until the pandemic and I started. So the first point is identifying that you want to actually make a difference. Then you figure out the, the platform or format you want to go. And you think about the name. Then you think about the niche. So that now helps you streamline things. Then you then have to consider, okay, what are your long-term goals? What are your short-term goals? My long-term goals is to publish... Or to do podcasting until like Peme. If my heads or successors want to continue from where I stop, I would really appreciate it. I mean, it has to go bigger than Amri. So, what is your succession plan at the end of this? So, you find out that for let's use artists, musicians. Most musicians have a succession in title. Or let's use there's this Chinese restaurant that was in court. Um, last year over the name of their, their brand. So someone was in partnership with them. After two, I mean, three years, relationship broke down and that person went to create this, went into the same, it was a noodles business. I went to the same line of business and used similar name, which the court held that that registration was actually done in bad faith. So once you figure out that, okay, okay, let's talk about Hilda. Now, they said Hilda had talked about this. This is like a five-year-long plan. So she has strategically positioned herself. Now, if you're someone that is not, so like me, that is not a, I'm not an extrovert. People feel I'm an extrovert because I'm always doing this. No, my normal me, there's lights, there's internet, I'm indoors. Just lock me inside the house. If I want to go out, I can go out. It's like I, I can't go out too. But there are days where you just know that, I'm, I'm all, we are those people that can just call you like five minutes. Guy, are you sure we're still going? That's the kind of person that I am. Are we still going? You know? Um, Link Hilda was very strategic. She she knew the brand she wanted to, to work with. So as a brand now, you don't have to figure out, okay, am I, am I positioning myself in a way that if I go and look for a sponsor um, for something I want to do, I will eventually get sponsors. Because most people just feel that, um, you know, putting out something out there, not, not working with the right kind of team or similar brands, they can do it by yourself. You really can't do it by yourself. You know, um, especially in this digital era where your digital footprint can go a long way to help you. Um, once in a while, I do a Google search about IP series, and I'm, and I'm amazed how far IP series have gone. 
Luckily, uh, Spotify for Podcasters has an algorithm that shows me how far my podcast has gone, even if it's one percent. But it's, it's a something like my granddad would say. Um, so have a strategy, um, identify your the elements that you want to monetize, have a monetization um, strategy, whether you're going to license or assign, or you're going to go into collaborations, or you're going to partner, or um, you're not going to keep creating and creating and creating. Some people do these things and put them use uh, put them in the public domain for free under the, the, the Creative Commons license. I'm just doing it because I want to just put something out there. Let anybody that wants to use it can use it and, you know, but make sure you acknowledge me as an owner. So once you figure that part out, you then have to now make a pitch. So I have, so it's like when I reach out to speakers, I'm like, I introduce myself where I'm based and I'm like, I have published X, Y, Z. If I want to blow my house, I'll say I've interviewed X, Y, Z. Like my late, I think my second to last guest happened to be an actor in Friday the 30th and I love her. I did not know that part about him until he mentioned it. I knew he was an actor, but I just did not know the film. So he transferred from being an actor into being an entertainment lawyer. When he said, I was like, oh, I'm talking to an actor. But yeah, so you now have that instance where you now have to position yourself in a way that people, when, when you go to make that pitch, your intangible asset can be your selling point. Uh, we've not got to the stage where people can use their IPs as collateral, but the conversations are building. I do recall during the pandemic, there was this, I used to be very active on this esports platform on, on Clubhouse where Dr. Seed spoke. And he talked about how he one time was looking to get something and you know he told the bank he would give them his his IP and they're like, what's that? And all those conversations. So I mean, why the conversations are changing or, or things are changing for us, um, just know that your whatever content you're building has commercial value. You might get to a point where you need to now evaluate and come up with a plan on how you intend to monetize at the end of the day um but so that's that's it i don't i don't know if i answered the question rosemond hi rosemond can't see you again i think rosemond is off <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I don't know if I should keep talking because I can't find rhythm. But basically, what I'm saying is that if you are in the startup business, um, pre market, post market stage, have a concept of how you want to make money or profit out of your products and then build on that and go. So I'll stop now since Rosemond is here. <laughs> Sorry about that. You know, in Nigeria, you need to have your backup of your backup of your backup so I can never be stranded. But yeah, um, I, I definitely got your point. And I think it's very important that you've placed these steps because I think it's a very strategic way to have a brand and also profit off that brand. I can tell you for a fact that this series that I am currently running, which I have been running since January, I can't believe it's almost six months, right? Um, there's a lot of work about me and what I do already in public domain. So I have a lot of people reach out. They want to use it for research and all that. It's a good thing, but you must know how to convert that intellectual property to 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 capital, right? And yes, everything is not about money, but everything is about value. And value is what you define value to be. So mm. if your goal, like you've mentioned, is, oh, I just want to do free stuff and bless the world with my gift, blah 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 i don't have any need to do anything with it it's okay right but if you're like okay while i'm blessing the world i want to be recognized for my work it's important that you pay attention to things like this if you want to bless the world with your gift and get value from that it is perfectly okay as well so this is just a um rounding off right now because i really i think i think that this has just been an incredibly enlightening session rounding off it's just clear beyond reasonable doubts that you cannot afford to be laid back when it comes to your creative work, because as much as you think it's not tangible, uh, it may not be like the phone in my hand. It may not be like something very tangible you can hold, but it is very, very tangible. It is very tangible. It may not be physical, but it's tangible. So the work you do, you must protect it. You must protect your staff. You must protect your employees. You must protect your business. You must protect your company. You must protect your assets, whether it is intellectual or otherwise. And I'm just super glad that we had this conversation. So thank you so much, Rita. I know we could go on and on. Trust me, I have a ton 
of questions to ask. But um, it's not the night to ask endless questions. I've, I've been looking at the comment section. I don't think I see any questions there. And I've gotten very lovely comments. Thank you so much. Um, somebody literally said that he walked in, she walked into the LinkedIn session. She wasn't looking, but she's so excited about the topic that we are discussing. So I'm very happy about that. Um, and I'm sure that this is a Saturday. A lot of people are resting with their homes and their families. So um, I'm sure when they come back online, they will see this. And it's recorded. It's live. It's on our repository. So you can always go back to it. So um, my final comment, I've said my final comment. Um, and I, I don't know, Rita, if you've said your final comment. I would just love to end this with an announcement. Um, so I'm really, really excited that we've really had this transition. But before I go to the announcement, Rita, do you have any final thoughts or any final comments for Robin as we round up, since we do not have any questions at the moment. Ah, uh, final thought. Please take your IP serious so that we we'll all make money and follow my podcast too. <laughs> all right, yes, please follow Rita's podcast. She's incredible at what she does. You can tell from the energy, you can tell from her experience. She has literally walked this talk, and I'm so excited. Just you know, really, I can't wait to get on some very interesting briefs with you soon. What do you think? <laughs> Nah, I did for you any day, any time. You're my sister. Of course, of course, of course. I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> so, guys, um, for those of you that have managed to stay to the end, I, I, I mentioned um in my email that I sent to all the registered attendees that there's going to be a package for those that stay to the end of this. So, as we all know. Um, we are having um, uh, um, a two-day masterclass on corporate governance for Nigerian startups. It's happening in July. It's one of uh, it's one of the ways we want to really celebrate the work we, we've been doing so far in this startup space. It's going to be a physical event. Um, it's happening on the first and second week of July, the 8th and 15th. And it's going to be um, at a physical location. We're going to be talking about you know just institutionalizing corporate governance principles into your organization. IP is going to be a discussion, risk analysis, corporate governance, you know, just a lot of very interesting things. And um, you can check my, my page. You'll definitely see a lot of uh, discussions going on on that. So please do out to register. The link to register is on my bio, so you can definitely check that. I'll fill the Google Forms, and I'll be looking forward to seeing you in the class. Um, for those of you that went to this session, you get a 5% discount on the amount of the registration. So if you watch to this point, right, just send me a DM, right, claiming your 5% discount, and I just want to use that opportunity to just celebrate everyone that has stayed to this moment um Oluwa, so let's put some very interesting comments on the screen so um Oluwa says um we are lightning shagui do he says really lightning thank you so much so yes please send our speaker her flowers um yeah we, we already have an invitation coming to you uh rita uh, he says, okay, she still says that you're going to invite us both to a similar seminar. Yes, we'll be excited. I'm sure Rita is very excited to travel, right? So, yeah, um, this will be an exciting conversation. Let's let's, let's keep the conversation. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Excited. So, yes, guys, um, that's the announcement. Please look forward to more announcements coming up from this space. Uh, this is Rita's podcast. She has a podcast that she releases. Very exciting. Talks about very, very interesting stuff in the IP space. Make sure you give her a follow. Make sure you give her a like. Um, go to all our pages, ensure you subscribe and ensure that you are following and you are also educating the founders and business owners in your space. Let them know how important it is for them to keep their businesses intact as far as their corporate governance and their intellectual property rights are concerned. So this brings us to the end of this series. I think this is one of the most exciting um, series I've had so far. I'm not even lying. Like every series is interesting, but this is super, super, super interesting. I just love the conversation i love the insight it was just like chatting and gisting with a friend very exciting i'm very excited about this so um on behalf of us uh rita is still here i want to say a very big thank you um thank you so much for just being here it's super exciting i'm going to call you after this and we're going to have a very interesting little conversation you know how we roll right uh, <laughs> so thank you so much everyone for being here uh on behalf of the us we want to say thank you for being part of this um, startup compliance series. I'm looking forward to seeing you in our master class in our new sessions. I'm looking forward to Rita. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Send her a message. Subscribing to our channel. Subscribing to our podcast. And I'm really excited. I will definitely see on the other side. So have a very beautiful evening, everyone, and um, have a very pleasant night.
It's very, very exciting just, you know, saying goodbye. Thank you, Rita, for being here. We're very happy to have you. Have a very blessed Thank evening. You. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.